That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Beast, the tenth film directed by Bertrand Bonello, which premiered in competition at the 2023 Venice Film Festival. It is being released courtesy of Janus Films in the U.S. Uh, as of April 5th, 2024. Do I know a Bertrand Bonello film? You know, I don't know that you've seen a uh, previous Bonello, but uh, I'm... I, I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, I did get to interview him for his 2016 feature, Nocturama, which was quite controversial the year that came out. Uh, I first became interested in him for his third feature, Tiresia, back in 03, which is about a Brazilian trans woman living outside of Paris who's kidnapped and denied her hormones and starts to revert uh, her gender. Uh, and also, uh, of course, there's a heavy uh, symbolism with Greek mythology with Tiresias. Uh, On War from 2008, which he previously worked with Lea Seydoux, where Ozzy Argento plays a, a woman who leads a pleasure cult. Um, my previous favorite of his was House of Tolerance, a film about uh, turn of the century prostitutes in a brothel, which is excellent if you have not seen it. Uh, Saint Laurent, which is one of the two biopics that came out about Yves Saint Laurent in 2014. Uh, Zombie Child was a recent feature of his, which is interesting. And I even liked his kind of experimental feature, Coma, from 2022. Hmm. What is this movie about? The plot is set partly in a near future in which artificial intelligence is in control of everyone's lives and human emotions are perceived as a threat. What is your pull quote? It's a tale of ennui and paralysis which wholeheartedly evokes the same unsettling sense of hesitation inspired by the fear of the unknown. Rarely has cinema examined the eternal yoke of humanity with such aplomb across time, genre, and circumstance. Bonello unveils his beast, which arrives if you're standing or on your knees. Mine. Feeling more like an assignment than an emotional visual experience, La Bette may be best served to those willing to put in the work. Yes. Notably, this is based on a 1903 novella by the great Henry James. Interestingly, another filmmaker in 2023 adapted the same novella with the same title, The Beast in the Jungle, uh, Patrick Chiha, an Austrian director, uh, which kind of does something similar in a contemporary way. That film is set 1979 through 2004 within uh, the confines of a nightclub. You said this was your favorite film of 2023. This was, uh, I think this film is brilliant. I gave it a perfect score. I was very uh, happy with the written review I had for the film. Uh, I think it's just such a stellar conversation piece in the way that cinema so rarely is these days. And yes, I understand that it probably is not for everyone and to many may feel like something of an assignment, but you have to agree that after watching this film, we had many very lengthy conversations. You know, it was such a pleasure. Um, so the story, it's kind of simple. So it's 2044 and AI kind of runs shit. And AI has made it so that... AI is telling us that humans are too emotional to do certain jobs. So Decision-making jobs, yeah. So AI has come up with a solution. There's a treatment people can go through where they can have their basically like their emotional baggage removed and we can get more into it as to what it's called but you can choose to do that and take uh decision making jobs and if you choose not to do that then you take jobs that really having uh emotional baggage doesn't affect so so menial tasks that are kind of beneath you if you're <clears throat> intelligent so the main character is played by Lea Seydoux Gabrielle Monnier and she decides to do it because she feels like the other jobs are beneath her. She also knows people who've done it, but she has very strong concerns. Like, what will I be like as a human being if I am not affected by my emotions? But she decides to do it. And then we visit her past lives, basically. Specifically in 1910 mm -hmm. and in 2014. Yes. So in 1910, we see her as this, like woman of means, she's married, um, and we see her at a party, and this guy approaches her, a guy named Louis, played by... George McKay. And he's like, hey girl, we met a few years ago, and I remember you because you said something that really like stuck with me. She basically told him that she hasn't really pursued like her passion because she's afraid that if she does, something catastrophic will happen. 
literally there's a beast waiting for her in the jungle that's going to pounce. So he's like, yeah, I totally remember you. And we can assume that it was about love, like passion. And that's back when she was single. So now that he's seeing her at this party in 1910, she's married. But she, like as the audience, we see that like her marriage is one of convenience. Like he's a nice guy and all, but she doesn't feel anything for him really. In short, it was not a risk. And, and she seems to be intrigued by Louis and Louis is very intrigued by her. And these, the, these intertwining plots are kind of cut piecemeal throughout. But the basic story for these two is that they are intrigued with each other. They meet a few times. They end up at a doll making factory, which we can get into. But they, and this is during a period where France has been flooded. Yeah. Or the Paris. So they're in a region where it's flooded and they're stuck in this doll making factory. And the factory catches on fire. And both of them die in this factory. So that's the 1910 story, the past life. Their love unrequited. Mm -hmm. But the 2014 past, life is, past lives are very different because we see that Louis is like... An incel, basically, living in... They're in Los Angeles. And he's speaking... Because George McKay's British and he speaks French. So in the 1910 version, he's speaking French. And then when he's speaking English, is with a British accent. In the, 19, in the 2014 version, he's supposed to speak like he's from the West Coast of the United States which I don't know if works very well, but he, um, he is basically like this 30 year old virgin who's complaining about how women don't like him. And he's like a terrorist because he's fully prepared to start killing women when clearly he's the problem. So that's his storyline. And then Gabrielle is an aspiring actor. So we see her go on an audition. She's told she should get plastic surgery. She's house sitting in this beautiful mansion in the hills. And Louis and Gabrielle's stories combined are intersect when there's an earthquake and Louis's been stalking Gabrielle and he basically threatens her and kills her. Yeah. And then the 2044, like current time, she has gone through the treatment, but it didn't take. She and we're told like... She's gone through it, what, three times? And we're told that the AI tells us like 0.7% of humans don't take it. So clearly she's super resistant. But Louis is back in her life again. And he did the treatment and it worked. And he remembers her from these past lives and he feels connected to her. And he, he finds her. They have a moment. And he tells her he loves her. And she has like a violent reaction. She breaks down in anguish screaming. Which we can talk about more. But basically she's devastated because now that she's ready to receive this love, it's not, he's not the same person. His love is real, but he is not. Okay. I don't have any notes of this movie. I, <laughs> but overwhelmingly I thought as a conversation piece, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's probably, I don't know that I've ever talked, had more to say about a movie discussing it afterwards but i do think that it felt like a chore to get through so i'm just gonna say what i didn't like first i don't like how the film looks uh shot by bonello's usual uh cinematographer or has worked with him many times jose de uh i didn't have a problem because i thought they were trying to have a marked uh visual disconnect between each of the periods I didn't quite get that. I mean, clearly when we're in 1910, we're in 1910. Mm -hmm. And then we're in 2024. I'm sorry, 2044. The environment, it almost feels like it's sterile, like during COVID lockdown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's... I Hearing you talk about the film in our best of, or yeah, our best of video and like it being your favorite. And then I read your review on Ion Cinema. I would have thought this would be much more lavish because the content is extremely rich. I agree. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like if, if the visual experience would have been as lavish, I mean, this would be like the greatest story ever told. But as it is, I found it dull. I think that there are a lot of choices, like I, all of the choices seem meticulous, but yeah. they just, I did not connect with this visual experience at all. I found the portrayals very flat and I, we went on and on about why that could be, and it makes sense. I just don't know that if a person, if you went to go see this, like totally dark, you're not familiar with the James. Henry James. The Henry James novella. If you really like Leia Seydoux, you, I had, do. you read the novella. I feel like if you went in without those um, assets 
and weren't prepared to really like think about this movie, I, I think it would be a bear to get through. But and it's unfortunate because I do feel like there could have been an approach that would have made this sort of a more lush experience See, and still have the rich subtext. I disagree that it is not a lush experience because I, I again, I have to use the word brilliant because this to me is what uh, art is supposed to induce this kind of feeling. And I think Seydoux, and I've said this before, between this and Bruno Dumont's France, which was my favorite film that year, like her ability to convey emotion across such an abstract uh, field in, in so many, like there are so many moments in this where she's reduced to tears where, I, I don't know, I, I watched this a second time, it's a lengthy movie, it's two and a half hours, and I still had a, a page filled up with notes, like you I, I found this completely engaging, captivating, energizing, I You said it. that and I did not think her range of emotion was all that. She cries a few times but it's like a couple tears. In the end, she has like a big moment where she screams and she's hysterical, but I thought like she, her range was pretty, I mean, it was see, a very narrow see, range. See, that's, I don't know, maybe it's just very, the my love for somebody like Andrzej Zulowski's films and Isabella Johnny and the, the, the Zulowski title that also comes to mind watching this film is a very telling title, The Most Important Thing Is To Love, which I think is what these two characters are grappling with. And sure, they're a bit flat, and but they are also never able to, they're, they're dancing around something, and that's what, the, the 1910, Ver, uh, segment of this is that's really the novella encapsulated there but Bonello takes it to such a uh, more definitive uh, he, he extrapolates upon it I think ways that are just fascinating uh, because that at the first time that I saw this I was listening a lot to um, Violet by Hole with you know Courtney Love is the the lead singer and the the resonant refrain from that track about what they, when they have what they want they never want it again that is how i the profound feeling i had at this moment where Sedu is breaking down screaming because at first it seems very perplexing but i i don't know there's there's just so many rich things and even watching it again how layered it is because in the 1910 version she's this pianist who is struggling with trying to find the emotional component of schoenberg who she finds very cold and that that is her her character throughout is her trying to keep uh, in connection, in, intact with her humanity. Um, I also like that there, there's this AI component, even in the 1910 version when we're talking about her husband has this doll making factory and this, she is explaining to George McKay about how we, the dolls only have one expression, a complacent one, so that it is, um, what's the word they're looking for? To please everyone like this, this absence of emotion is the only thing that can please everyone. But maybe that's not the answer for humanity. I love that they die between two extreme elements, fire and water, both things that are gonna kill them and they're between stuck in a, a rock in a hard place. I love that in opposition to AI, in the 1910 and 2014 version, they have psychics and how that has changed. Because it, the great Alina Lowenstone is a, a psychic in the 1910 version that's giving Seydoux's character hints about something that's going to happen, you know, a century later. Uh, and then in 2014, it becomes her visiting a psychic hotline on the internet. And that is a very David Lynchian moment, that old lady that she's speaking to that's really creepy. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you go through your notes? We don't well, have they're scattered all over the place because I think this is just a, a film that you have to, have to talk through. But you... <laughs> That I, I don't know, like that I, I feel like you're either in with the, the vibe of this movie or you're not. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot to talk about. But I mean for a review <laughs> video, it's like well, the highlights. Well, if we're McKay has a line in the nineteen ten version where he says, Fulfillment lies in the lack of passion. And it, it that that's what and, and there's the, all this fear of taking the risk. Like the, the low and so and psychic says like, risk is life, that, that is what's exciting. Uh, something I love about the 2044 version is there's these nightclubs. It's the same club, but every night they change to a different year of music because we're always living in the past. I love the soundtrack selection. You got Patsy Cline in there that George McKay is listening to. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, the, and these rude girls, this, this rude pack of women that are mean to her in the LA version and then in 2044. And they have, they say something very telling in the 2044 version, which is the crisis has happened. There's nothing we're afraid of and we're bored. <laughs> so it's, uh, to me, this is why this film is speaking about 
intricate things about what it means to be human is we need something to struggle against, but also once our desires are completed or, or fulfilled, then that is, I don't think it needs to mean that, but often what happens is it is the end of passion. And we're seeking, uh, there's, I don't know, just the details in this film. In 2014, if you notice in the house, there's a framed portrait of the poem If by Rudyard Kipling, which is all about a father talking to his son about how not to get too caught up in the extremes of, um, uh, of like uh, either triumph or disaster. And I don't know, to me, this is, this is a film that's about taking risks and the worst possible place to be is if you do not take the risk, if you hesitate. I, I, I don't know, I, I found it profound, I found it moving, I find it fascinating watching this woman who's like so scared of no longer feeling that, you know, that she, it, it's like a Greek tragedy. You end up exactly in the place where you're trying to avoid being. So I don't know, I, I to me this is, I, th there's no one really making films, especially in the US at, at this kind of a caliber and um, I don't know, I just, I, I appreciated the opportunity to watch it again and I'm glad you uh, took the risk and gave your time to it, but it is, um, yeah, I don't know. I can't. I can't really say enough about it. But I'm also probably incredibly biased. But I, I absolutely love this movie. You gave the film five out of five. Mm -hmm. um, I would give it two and a half out of five because I'm in the middle. Like I didn't care for it, but I think it's an excellent film to talk about. I don't know that it makes sense to spend three hours making a video talking about it, but I think. If a person's willing to go in, you know, probably don't watch it with someone you're in a love relationship with, but may, go with people and discuss it afterwards. I think that would be, it would be a very stimulating conversation. But I would think that to if you're in a loving romantic relationship, <laughs> that is this, th these are things that are worth talking about. What is the reality? I'm not saying they're not worth talking about. I just think that these are probably topics that people need to sort of work through maybe separate and then when they have fully formed thoughts they could bring that to their love it's it's you know i mean it's one of those things where it's like when you talk through something and you i don't know i think being confronted with the discomfort and the darkness of what it means to be human is imperative because not it the the opposite means nothing unless you also have the ability to work through I feel like this is an example of a film where someone really connected to the subject matter and brought a lot to it and to them it's a perfect movie. I don't think this is a perfect film. Like, <laughs> there are a lot of things about it that didn't work for me. So it's, but I could see how someone would really, like it's more like, in a, like if someone says it's a perfect film, it's like an emotionally perfect film. Oh, and I can see how someone would not respond to it uh, positively at all. But I, th I think that that is the, also the great thing about art is uh, great art is worth taking that risk. What else would you like to say? That's it. All right. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>